Something up there is moving. What is it? How far is it? Are there others? How do we get there? Humans have asked many questions about the heavens since the dawn of time. But it wasn't until the discovery that certain stars wandered across the heavens that the floodgate of questions was open. It wasn't long after the invention of the spyglass that astronomers pointed it at the heavens in search of answers. We figured out that the wandering stars weren't stars nor were they wandering. Instead, they followed a pattern which could be predicted. Once we realized that there were physical places just like the way the Earth is, it became a goal of humanity to find out what is happening in these other worlds high above our heads. But first, we had to learn how to jump high, really high. This is a 12-part series that highlights some of the achievements we've made with unmanned spacecraft in our never-ending quest to make the space beyond Earth feel like home. Since the thought experiment of Sir Isaac Newton in 1687, We've known that if you throw something horizontally fast enough, it would never fall to the ground. Due to the natural obstructions such as mountains, the object had to be thrown from the highest point in its path for this to work. The cannonballs, which were the fastest things at that time, weren't nearly as fast as required. And even if they were, carrying them to the top of a mountain was next to impossible. So no one put this to a test for the next 270 years until 1957. With the launch of Sputnik, the USSR finally proved that Sir Isaac Newton was correct. While this mission was motivated for other reasons, it certainly proved that objects can fly around the Earth for months, at the very least, without requiring additional energy after release. This capability has many benefits in the field of communication, reconnaissance, weather prediction, and more. But none of them got us closer to other worlds. For that, we had to fly faster. The closest world to our own is the moon, so naturally, that became the first destination. Getting there meant using a more powerful rocket or more rockets stacked together. Either way, the problem that needed to be overcome in order to get to the moon didn't stop there. We had to develop batteries that were reliable, lightweight, and lasted as long as the trip to the moon required. On top of that, we had to develop transmitters and receivers powerful and sensitive enough to receive a signal from the moon. Up until then, the maximum distance a radio transmission had to travel between transmitter and receiver was a little more than a quarter of the circumference of the Earth. That was about 10,000 kilometers, compared to what is now required, which is 384,000 kilometers. After a few launch failures, the Soviets managed to pull it off with Lunar 1 in January of 1959. Almost. Lunar 1 became the first man-made object to reach Earth's escape velocity. While en route to the moon, it made the first direct measurements of the solar wind. It also gave us more data on Earth's outer radiation belt. However, for its main mission, it failed to hit the moon and missed it by about 6,000 kilometers due to an error during launch. Nonetheless, it proved that we can reach other worlds and communicate in deep space. Reaching other worlds is pointless if we can't get there with a useful payload. And the more useful a payload is, the heavier it would usually be. The heavier the payload, the more powerful the rocket has to be. So naturally, 
effort was put into that. As we started to make rockets more powerful in the attempt to reach other worlds, we also started making our payload more sophisticated. While the Soviets were preparing to take another shot at hitting the moon, the Americans launched the Explorer 6 in August of 1959. Its main goal was to orbit the Earth and among other things, collect data on cosmic rays and radio wave propagation in the upper atmosphere. Because Explorer 6 would be orbiting the Earth for some time, it had to employ solar panels to constantly recharge its batteries. Collecting data from orbit was an important step because it helps us understand how the protection provided to us by our atmosphere transitioned into the dangerous vastness of space. This is where future satellites and humans would spend years operating. One interesting thing about Explorer 6 is that it had a television scanner on board. This gave it the ability to take pictures and transmit them to Earth, making it the first spacecraft to take images of the Earth from orbit. This is not the first photograph of the Earth. That honor goes to a V-2 rocket launch on a suborbital trajectory by the Americans in 1946. However, the Explorer 6 image, even though it lacked detail, represented the idea of being able to photograph the Earth at any time as long as the satellite was orbiting. In the case of Explorer 6, that was two long years. Within that time frame, the Soviets took another shot at the moon and this time it was a hit, literally. In September of 1959, the Soviets successfully placed Lunar 2 the first man-made object onto another world. Even though this was an impactor, meaning it simply crashed into the moon, it proved that we could successfully send objects from Earth to other worlds. It also proved that the surface of the moon was solid just like the Earth. While en route to the moon, Luna 2 released sodium vapor into space to help scientists visually observe its trajectory using ground-based telescopes. As the ability of humans to visit other worlds steadily increased, we realized that we now had the ability to take pictures in deep space and send them back to Earth. So it wasn't long before an age-old question was answered. What does the far side of the moon look like? Even though the moon rotates on its axis, only one side of the moon always faces the Earth, the near side. The other side, the far side, is never visible from Earth. So in order to photograph it, we had to go behind the moon as seen from Earth. Since light and radio waves are all electromagnetic waves, when we're behind the moon and the moon prevents the light from Earth from reaching us, it will also prevent our radio transmission from reaching Earth. In other words, we cannot directly communicate with Earth when we're on the far side of the moon. However, the Soviets pulled it off once again with Lunar 3 in October of 1959 and took the first photograph of the far side of the moon. Due to signal blackout on the far side of the moon, Lunar 3 had to store the images until it was near the Earth again where the ground station could better receive its transmission. The fact that Luna 3 returned to Earth without additional energy spin after the initial launch from Earth also highlights two new aspects of space travel that humans can now rely on. One is gravity assist, a maneuver where gravity and the relative velocity of the celestial body is used to change the velocity of a spacecraft. And the other is free return trajectory, a trajectory that returns a spacecraft to its original location after passing by a target body without needing additional energy. This type of trajectory would later be used to save lives in space. By the beginning of the 1960s, humans were starting to feel comfortable about sending spacecraft to other worlds. In 1960, 
Pioneer 5 was sent into orbit around the Sun by the Americans. Specifically, it was sent to investigate the interplanetary space between Earth and Venus. Pioneer 5 became the first man-made object sent into interplanetary space. It would remain active for three months before ground stations could no longer receive its signal due to its distance. That distance was about 36 million kilometers. The furthest distance the spacecraft was able to communicate with Earth at that time, about 95 times the distance from Earth to the Moon. In 1961, after a failed attempt, Venera 1 was sent towards Venus by the Soviets in an attempt to hit Venus like they did with Lunar 2 on the Moon. Due to the long distance the spacecraft had to travel, about 270 million kilometers, small errors in velocity at release time became a major offset from the target body at the time of arrival. Since velocity error always happens during release of a spacecraft, Venera 1 was equipped with the first mid-course correction All previous deep space missions had a ballistic trajectory. Mid-course correction required a spacecraft knowing its attitude within the celestial sphere. This is something that cannot be determined from Earth, so Venera 1 employed for the first time the use of a sun and star tracker to compute its attitude. This is similar to the way sailors from hundreds of years prior adjusted their course based on the position of the stars. Unfortunately, communication with Venera 1 was lost at a distance of just 3 million kilometers, and because of this, the course correction engine, star and sun tracker were never used, causing Venera 1 to miss Venus by about 100,000 kilometers. Venera 1 was equipped with a high gain antenna which was supposed to be deployed near Venus, making it the first spacecraft to use such a dish, a usual necessity for communicating from a long distance. This however, was also never used. It was known since the mid-1900s that the sun had some effect on telegraphs and later on on radio and radar equipment. Basically, the sun could disrupt our ability to communicate on Earth and in space, something that's important when traveling between worlds. But to study these effects in better detail required placing instruments beyond the Earth's atmosphere for extended periods. This was all but impossible until humans had the ability to place spacecraft in orbit around Earth and be able to communicate with them for years. The concept of the space-based scientific observatory became a reality. In the next episode of From Cradle to Planets, we will continue our journey with spacecraft that enable us to visit other worlds from afar, starting with the first space-based observatory. I'm Dex DFX for Aiming for the Stars.